like to introduce Phil Alberts, who you all know. Uh, his uh, partner in crime here is Cian Swan, and together they're going to take you tripping through our history. So thank you again. Thank you, ma'am. First, thanks for coming, guys. Great. I love it. Uh, one thing about the scholarship that most people don't know, Mountain Ranch Scholarship is a little bit different. They give it to anybody that wants to go to a higher education, a trade school, a two-year, a four-year, whatever. You don't have to have a 3.5 to get in. You can be the dumbest kid in class, but as long as that college will support, uh, make you come in, we give them a scholarship. That's very unusual. My wife is in charge of the scholarship for the volunteers at Mark Twain. You have to have a 3.5 to even make an application. Oh, put Wally's name up there. You got it, the next one? Wally Motlock started this about six, eight, ten years ago. And him and I spent a week doing all these pictures that I had for the thing. And he put it on his laptop. So we showed it and had a good time. So I called him up and I said, Wally, send me that information. I'm just going to duplicate it. And he said, well, I'm I just gone. So I went through my photos and Mrs. I gave them to Mrs. Swan, a trunk, big as that table, for uh, the pictures I had. And she has spent three days taking those big ones and those little ones and making them this size so we could look at them on her disk there. I'm such a computer genius that I gave it to her. <laughs> I need a little light here. Turn, turn the light back on. Just this little one right here, just a little. Not, not so bright. Yeah. Anyway, I think we ought to give Mrs. Swan a hand of appreciation. She did a fabulous job. Mountain Ranch started about 1846 out at what we call the Chicken Foot. That's the Three Forks out Whiskey Slide Road, where the road goes like that. And that's where it started in 1846, before Marshall just found some gold up there in Coloma. Hey, Phil, can you stand a little bit to the left? So no. <laughs> No, that's all right. I got it. Anyway, thank you. Thank you. Uh, in the early days, the water ditches were the most important part of Mountain Ranch, even before the roads were very well built. The road you call Michael Road was the main road to Mountain Ranch because it's almost level. The one coming in on what we call Mountain Ranch Road, it gets pretty steep in a couple of spots. So when you got two wagons and 14 horses, that's a tough go. So Michael became the main road, and then they did the water ditches. Use your what? Use your pointer. Oh, my pointer. Oh, OK. I forget that. Uh, later on, we'll get into the post offices. And there was five post, four post offices in this area before Mountain Ranch Post Office at the Josie Ranch. There you go. Uh, see, mountain Ranch is what they call Old Mountain Ranch nowadays, but we were called El Dorado, an El Dorado camp. We weren't very uh, well liked in the county. That's right there. There's, there's, a, there, there's El Dorado. That ditch that comes down that says Treach Ditch uh, was the main ditch that went to Cave City where they did the hydraulic mining along Cave City Road. Lots of it. Okay. So we're right in the center, right? Yeah, right in the middle, right there. The reason that changed was I'll I'll do that first. I'm gonna skip around because my mind doesn't run in a good sequence. <laughs> There's Mountain Ranch in nineteen oh seven, but the post office was in the Josie Ranch. That was the town of Mountain Ranch. No, no, that's all right. 
And this town called El Dorado Camp did not have a post office. But the main road, just like today, if you're off the freeway, you practically die. And the freeway from the Valley Springs train station to the Sheep Ranch Mine, which was by far the largest thing going on in this neck of the woods, the old mountain ranch died. This became an important center because those wagons travel about 10 miles a day. That's why if you look in all the map of all of the mother load, every town is almost 10 miles apart. You can go 25 horseback, but 10 with a wagon. See, now, that is this uh, building that burned down, the Sender's Market. That's the big wooden warehouse that's uh, across from the candle shop. That's my barn. That's my house. The hotel is right back in there. This building's gone. That building's gone. This is where the Lutheran Church is now. And the schoolhouse on Avenue A, right there. Okay. This was Mountain Ranch, 1933. This building here is where the real estate office is, now called Stark Realty. It was my Albert Realty, and then it was Mountain Ranch Realty, but now it's Stark Realty there. This building was an assay office. That's the candle shop. And that's the, my big junk room. And this here is Sender's, old Sender's Market. Do you notice the picket fences? In the old things, I have seen a number of articles written about the picket fences in Mountain Ranch, and it was called the town of picket fences. Okay. 1933, that's the town hall. This was our woodshed in, back in those days because there was a wood-burning stove in that room and a fireplace. Now they got air conditioning and automatic heaters and oh, insulation in the ceiling. Oh. Anyway, that was completed in 1938. Prior to that, the town hall was held at the Doogie Building, which is right next door, the big stone building that Frank owns. But that's uh, what's left, and that's the old fire, the firehouse that was, we have now. Okay. This building still stands. It's right across the street from Cinders. Uh, notice the picket fences? You can see there that there's Louis Domagini and Mr. Tillander, Louis DeVoto, Joe DeVoto, who was a postmaster at a while, Mrs. Rodicino that owned the store before Cinders, Paul Lewis, he lived up the road about three miles, Kent Wilson is his grandson, when Paul came back from the First World War, he, that's his uniform there, he couldn't understand why Mountain Ranch didn't have a telephone. So he strung a wire from his ranch to Murphy's. He had a telephone. We didn't have one. That's the Josie Ranch. Remember the picket fences? Somebody had a good business going making pickets, I'll tell you that. <laughs> I don't know when that photo was taken, but my guess is back in the 20s, possibly in the 30s. And our first post office, that was a modern one there that taken not too many years ago. But again, uh, Doug Josie resurrected most of the picket fences around. Oh, and that was the first post office there. That's a good shot of the back of Josie's. The, the building was originally built in the 1850 as a one story. And about 10 years later, they added a wooden second story. That was quite a hub at one time. Uh, here's the Doogie building that Frank owns. He's hiding here somewhere. And that was our second post office when it transferred from Mountain Ranch to El Dorado. And Cinder's building, that was our second post office that was owned by the Rodocino family. The name Rodocino should be familiar the young 15-year-old girl was killed on that stagecoach robbery down the road a ways. 
her tombstone is in the cemetery. That was the Rodicino family, and, and that building, uh, my junk room, is still there. It's been there for, in 1897, they built that wooden building. Oh, post office number five? That's number two. Go ahead. Third. There it is, four. That's the Lutheran church, which is right next door. And uh, they recently tore the bad roof off and replaced it with uh, a nice comp roof, nice metal roof. There's a name for these half houses back east, and I don't know what it is. Salt box. What? Salt box. Salt box? Oh, okay. I don't know whether I believe that or not. Do you believe that? <laughs> anyway, they scrounged some pickets, and there they are. Where's the other half of the house? <laughs> back in Maryland. In 1927, the post office was in all the old towns, the post office was in the store because that's where you did your business. But in 1927, Mae Javu said, no, no, we want a post office. So her and her husband built that six by eight post office. And that was setting, see the picket fence? That was setting right next to that building across from Cinder's in that lot. Mrs. Javu was a postmaster there for 33 years. And in, in 1952, they outgrew this, so they built a larger one. That one. And that's the old one there. And everybody knows where Pollardville is, down by Lodi, Sacramento. It was a little mother load village the guy made, had a restaurant. If he had a good PR man, he'd have beat Kentucky Fried Chicken because in those days he had the greatest. And that was down there for many, many years. And this was our post office until 1982 when we built the big one down the street a little ways. I called up Mr. Pony, there's Major Vu right there. I called up uh, Mr. Pollard when I first come here and I heard the story about this post office that was and got moved. And he never met me and I never met him. He said, Phil, you don't have enough money to buy that post office. <laughs> and that was true, I didn't. But anyway, he said, if anything ever happens, I'll let you know. So Mr. Pollard died and his son took over the business. And uh, I don't know, when was it? Five, six, seven years ago? He called me on the phone and said, Phil, come get your post office. So Eric took his forklift and his big truck and half a dozen of us went down there and we brought that back up here. It's on display across from Frank's building right across the street there. That guy is Mr. Kuzlidge. Family was very predominant in Mountain Ranch in the early part of the years and they were all good looking guys. I mean, they just knocked your socks off. They were just fabulous. There was a half a dozen of them. They owned the ranch out on Cave City Road, right at the Hidden Valley Cave City Fork. Mr. Kuslidge. Now this guy right here is Dave Zwinger, and, and that's Virginia Butterfield. She was a postmaster for 20 some years in that building. And uh, Dave lived in Mountain Ranch all his life. When I came here, he was about 85 years old gave me a really hard time. The Flatlander coming up here, buying that store, oh my God, I was in trouble. But anyway, Dave become a really, really good friend. See, they got a, they got a card party right there, see that? We used to have card parties in this building once a month, and a dance the opposite weekend, once a month, the first few years I lived here. Oh! There's Jenny Devoto, who was a postmaster, and her mother. Who invented mail. <laughs> yeah. Looks like the back of my house. That was taken in front of Frank's building, the Doogie building, before uh, it had a porch on it, and it rotted and fell away. And then many years later, a guy named Don Marvin put that porch on there that Frank takes care of now. So that was some of the mountain ranch guys. See, if you look down here, you can see the foundation for this building. 
1938 is when we uh, started this building here. That's a school on Avenue A. We didn't have a school, but they had one at Cave City and they had one at Banner Road. I think there might be some guys here that went to school at Banner. Did you go to school at Banner? No, I was there when my dad and Joe Joseph and all of them loaded up and hauled it in. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> anyway, they moved that from Cave City to Avenue A. And that's some of the more intellectual students, I assume. <laughs> it's now a private home. There's 19, 1893. This guy right here is Cash Damagini. His father owned the store that I ended up with. Yeah, look at some of them faces. Oh my gosh. That guy's got awful big ears. Anyway, Cash is buried at the Mountain Ranch Cemetery. There's another shot of the school. There's about three boys there, and the rest are all girls. There's one, there's one, and there's one. Mountain Ranch School. Yeah, <laughs> they had to work. They had to work. There's the Sunday School. That building across the street from Cinders when I came here was a Sunday School. And we had 25 or 30 kids went to Sunday school there every Sunday. Looks like this gal right here kept them in line. There's Bob Lidecker. When, <laughs> he when I come here, he was driving a school bus, but Bob did many, many things in his early life. He was a well-decorated Second World War veteran. I'd been here about a month. And I got a call on the telephone, and he says, this is Bob Lidecker. I said, hello, Bob, how are you? He said, your kid, Stephen, who was about eight or nine years old, is down at Lower Michael. I said, Bob, you drive the bus, how come? He said, I kicked his butt off the bus. <laughs> that was the last time Stephen got in trouble on the bus, let me tell you. Now just think about it, if a bus driver did that today, they'd hang him. Anyway, his daughter is here tonight. <laughs> when did you move here, Phil? You'll find that out in the second half of our show. Oh. <laughs> yeah, there's Rodecito. There were the people that had the big store where Cinder's was. That, uh, uh, Gus Cinder acquired that in 1950 from the Rodecito family. And uh, that's one of the bills I found. And see, see Zwinger up there? That was the guy that was standing by the post office way back when. The Zwinger family had 11 children. And they had a big ranch out by the Sierra Vista Lookout. And next door to them was the Philippine family. If you go to the Red Barn Museum in San Andreas, you'll see this information there. But 11, I mean four of the Zwingers married four of the Philippines. So they're real thick in San Andreas, so don't talk about them, you'll get in trouble. You notice the blasting powder. See? He owed $57, so they brought it forward. See, he still had that. Whiskey, blasting powder. Rodecino, yeah. Nine pounds of cheese, 15 cents a pound, 135. And a bottle of whiskey, 25 cents. Yeah. <laughs> now there is the Sender's Market about the time that Gus Sender, Eric's father, bought it. About 1950. Was it still in use? Huh? Was it still in use at that time? Yeah. Really? What a great building. Yeah. Yeah, it was still in use. The old Rotocita store, they called it. Okay, go ahead. Now there's the Doogie building that Frank has right across behind next door, and that's Cinder's Market at the end of the street. See? You can see some picket fences right in there. <laughs> now there's the front of Rodecino's store, 
And this building back here, uh, they had uh, some old time hardware they sold. And this building right there is the one that is standing at the location of the present real estate office. I've got a names in my archives of three or four of these guys, but I love that guy right there. He's my hero. Uh, now there's the Sunday school building, the one across from Cinders, right back there. See the picket fence? And there's some kids that uh, look like they put on a play or something at Sunday school. And there's Cinders, old Cinders Market. Dig. He ran the mail from San Andreas all over, you can read wherever he went, and uh, to El Dorado and to Cinder, Chi Chi Flat, which had a store out there at the Three Forks. Uh, while I'm on the Chi Chi Pioneer Flat, Hotel I'll bring up Chief something Ranch. else. I'm going to that skip all over the bottom my mind doesn't keep this thing in sequence. And at Chi Chi the, Flat, the road there was a nice big from Scotts Junction to Sheep Ranch wasn't there in those days. The road to Sheep Ranch went all the way down past Cave City, hit O'Neill Creek, and went up the creek to Sheep Ranch. That was the main road. That must have been a good set of horses and a hell of a teamster. That's all I can say. Anyway, people think that the Pony Express got their name from him. Because the Pony Express did not come into being until a half a dozen years after old Digny did his thing. The stagecoach robbery. This lady here, oops. Sorry, I'll go back. Sorry about this, that. Uh, the lady here was on the stage with the Rodocina girl that was killed, that Mrs. Philippine. She was on the stage, and that's Domagini, and that's uh, Judge Lewis, I think. Uh, when, this is when they dedicated that monument in 62, I think. The Clampers had a lot to do. Anybody familiar with the Clampers? <laughs> Most all these monuments you see around here are put together and instigated by the Clampers, the E. Clampus Vitus. If you'll read the bottom line in a lot of those, you'll see that. You know, they put on a big front of being a bunch of idiots and a bunch of drunks, but they do a lot of historical work. Hey, there you go, see? The Matuka chapter, and that was... Uh, Murphy's. And she, the girl that was killed on that stage is buried in the Mountain Ranch Cemetery. Got a tombstone about this high. There she is, right there. There's another picture of her. Yeah, she don't look like 14. Look like she's 80. <laughs> There's a shot of the tombstone. That's up on top of the hill. Now there's Sender's market after Gus Sender's bought it and improved it. He put up a flagpole from the post office. That's the second post office that we had there. And in later years, this must have been about, oh, 1960 or so, Gus Sender built a bar right there. And that was called, that's before the blunder ever thought about it. That was called Opa's Smokehouse. Opa they told me was grandpa in German. Is that right? Yeah, okay. Anyway, he smoked sausages and had all kinds of German stuff and served it free in the bar as long as you stayed there and drank some beer. So, and when the fire came in 1968, it started in the bar and went up that wall right there and that's all wooden rafters and it caught that fire and went into the second floor. Eric's father and mother lived in the second floor uh, there. They had a good sized uh, apartment upstairs. My son Stuart, this was on Christmas morning. He got up about five o'clock and come in and woke me up and said, is Santa Claus come yet? Shut up kid and get back in bed. It's five o'clock in the morning. And I looked at the shade on my window. At that time, I lived in the building where the real estate office is. That was my house. 
And I thought the Christmas tree was blowing in the wind because, you know, it was going like this against my shade, but it wasn't. It was that fire. There's an outdoor stairway in the back that goes to the second floor. So I run around to the back and went up and kicked in the door and, and Gus and his uh, wife slept in separate rooms. And I got Gus out and got him down. I went back and got her. People do strange things in emergencies. That poor lady picked up her purse, opened it up, picked out her watch, set the purse down, and down we went. <laughs> I don't know what significant that watch had, but it was something. And Gus says, the money, it's upstairs under my bed. Because they took the cash register drawer out and took it upstairs every night. Well, I went back upstairs and kicked in the door and I almost got blowed off the second floor, a little flashback. So I said, Gus, it's gone. Anyway, that was Opus Smokehouse. We had a good time there, a honky-tonk piano and all kinds of good stuff. There are some people that thought they were ball players. <laughs> that, that, that's the, uh, the Mountain Ranch uh, Sunday School right back there. Uh, now I got a, we had a good team. We, had a, we ended up with a pretty good team in the 20s. And this is, uh, we're playing Valley Springs. Now this field right here is the one that's right across the street, right there. Right across behind the post office. That's where that is being played. I love those hats, look at them. Oh, that's like the Mardi Gras. Anyway. That's old Dave's winger, and he always wore his hat cockeyed. He never had a flat hat, hat in his life. He's six foot eight, he was a, quite a man. And that's a sawmill, and one time it was for sale. That was the first steam-powered course in, in a half mile above Mount El Dorado, it's Mount Ranch, the first steam-driven mill in Calaveras County. It was brought from Murphy's over here. Now, how'd you like to move that around with a team of horses? That's the fellow that had a sawmill where that burner is across the street. He had a sawmill there, and he operated the hotel as a place for his workers and, and whatnot. Joe Josephson. That's Carl Howard, Thelma Howard's husband and Jerry Howard's father. That's when they had logs. That's when they really had logs, you know. That house at, across the street from where I live, right past the cinders there, burned down about, what, a month ago or so? So I salvaged part of the siding that did not burn. And I was talking to an old timer, because it's redwood, and it's really fine grain and no knots. And I asked him about it, and he said in the old days when they harvest redwood, they cut the tree down, made lumber until they got to the first limb. That's junk. That's why you see this redwood today, the old stuff, with no lots in it. Now there's a multi-looking crew. Now the big guy, we, we know him, that's old Dave Winger. That cockeyed hat of his. I don't know where they find. It's Phil Sheridan and Uncle. Uh, looked like they're raking some hay or something. Out, they had a ranch out past the Three Forks. It's one of the haystacks. See the fence around it? Tisher family. They, that Sunday school and that building across from Cinders, that's a Tisher building. They're the family that owned that. Why was the fence there? Pardon? Deer. Of course, that's all they ever ate was deer, but uh, you know, so. <laughs> Judge Smith. He was a big, big guy in Calaveras County in the 20s, 30s, way back when. I never met him. Quite a man. Now that's what that building looked like when I got here. You see these, these 50 gallon barrels? White gas and kerosene. See? 
That Coca-Cola sign is probably worth a thousand dollars today. Uh, that's probably about, nine, well, that car there is what, is it 50, 6, 51, 52? That, that sign right there that stuck out, I sold that for a small fortune. That's the house there that burnt. Went down. And you see these, oops, <laughs> that's all right. You see those foundation things? If you take a look at those, they're a five, square five-gallon tin can and that's what they sold gas in they brought it up here in 50 gallon barrels and you bought five gallons of gas they put it in a can and gave it to you and he had some left over I guess when he built that building so they used them for forms and they're still there you can take a look see they're still there am I stretching this out long enough it's time to go home yet <laughs> <coughs> That's old, now called M24. It was called Brown's Reservoir in the beginning. Then it was called Emory because Emory Mining Company bought it and they run the water from there down to Cave City. Just above Mountain Ranch a little ways you can see that 36 inch pipe coming out of the wall. That was for hydraulic mining. 1917. Oh, some bathing beauties. Rumors in Calaveras. <clears throat> he didn't know the swimming suits were mandatory. <laughs> I, I have no idea who it is. <laughs> uh, uh, that guy we saw in front of the post office was uh, uh, a Kuthlich, and there's some of them there. They had a saloon in Mountain Ranch. If, and that set, see the picket fences? I'm, I'm, I love those picket fences. <laughs> now right back there is the hotel, the one across the street there, see? And this was at the end of Garibaldi before you get to Mountain Ranch Road. So behind that was the, the stack, right? Pardon? Behind that was that, that smoke, or uh, that, that burner, burner. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Okay. Oh. See, there's Kuthlich, he owned that saloon. Good for one drink. I have a token from the Sheep Ranch Hotel, not the one that's there now, but the other one is called a Poe, P-O-E, for 12 and a half cents. <laughs> I, a, oh, there's uh, Andrew uh, Kuthlich. That was in that building that he owned. That was the Kuthlich home in Mountain Ranch, and I have never figured out where it was. It's long gone, see the picket fences, but I don't know where that house sat. I've never been able to figure that one out. But Isla is the Kuthlich, Isla Kuthlich is that little girl on the porch. Kuthlich kids. Uh, the family now lives in Stockton but they were all good looking. The guys were better looking than the girls. <laughs> that's Isla. As an example. See, that's, uh, that's the Doogie building right, that Frank's got right there. This is an old shed that I've tore down that was on the one across the street. <coughs> Looks like a horse rail. Oh, there's old Clyde. He was a local Casanova <laughs> right there. 1928, had a new hot rod. <laughs> Look at the picket fences. <laughs> Larry, Earl, Bertha, Celia, Philippine, Kuthley, David, and Linda Lark. I don't know who that was. That was right after the Second World War. You can tell that by the Jeep. The Damagini family. Attilio Domagini was the one that started the store there before Cinders was ever there. And <clears throat> that's him in about 1870 something. And his son Louis took it over 
uh, many, many years later. I can't remember the date, 72. Now there's Louis Domagini and his devoted sidekick, Francis DeVoto. That is Jerry Howard's step-grandfather. Jerry Howard lives in the Adobe house just over the hill, going towards that, right across from Cinder's driveway. Louis died in 1962, and I never met him. He was a very good guy, promoted Mountain Ranch a lot. Now there's my house, and there's the store next to it. Now that's what the store looked like shortly after I bought it. I put this sign up and I hung it. Now that's a mulberry tree. Now if you've ever had a mulberry tree that bears fruit, whoosh, the flies are thick. I don't know what the old timers did with the berries. We had a bulletin board and that uh, telephone booth is on my patio. And that was a walk-in box. That's all right. There you go. Yeah. You can see the garage down there, and the old timers should sit on the porch all the time. I don't know who the little girl is. But, uh, that was a walk in box, and finally it got useless, so I hooked my pickup on it and was going to drive it down toward the barn, and it fell apart. And it had six inches of shredded redwood bark for insulation. And it was all over town. Eric was really pissed. Hmm? The, picket fence. the what? The picket fence. Oh, I don't know. What happened to that? There you go. Split rail. There's the Domagini. It was like J.C. Penney called it a cash store. Guaranteed, first class. And this is a note from Cash Domagini, who we saw in grammar school. Uh, they ordered guns. You didn't have to take it to Rusty to register a gun in those days. You just bought it. Uh, and that's, oh, there you go. There's Caroline Domagini, which was the wife of the old guy, and I don't know who that was. And this is Cash. Uh, I don't know who that was. And this guy looks like Pete, a guy named Petey. I remember him, and that's the front door what is now called a candle shop. Oh, this is part of it. This is Valenti here. That was uh, Clorinda Domagini's parents. And the Valenti family still are big cattle people over around Murphy's. This is uh, Atilio and Clorinda. When I came here, he'd already passed away, but she owned everything. And what I bought she owned it. She was a great lady. Almost six foot tall, Italian. Woo! Oh. Great lady. Now they're and they're when they got married, I think. He, he wasn't bad looking. It must have been the 1920s or so. Look at that haircut. That's when we put the, uh, when they first put the Bell Monument over here on Whiskey Slide Road. Uh, that's Louis Domagini there. That's probably Clorinda next to him. And there's when Louis passed away. That was in 1963. That was a couple of years before I got here. He was only 61. That's Thelma Howard. For those that might know Jerry Howard's mother, they had a small ranch uh, on the third fork. When you take the middle fork out here, the three forks, take the middle one, they had a ranch out there. This is the back of the Doogie Building. She's standing right close to Whiskey Slide and Mountain Ranch Road. That was 1947. Thelma was real active in this community club, did a lot of work for uh, the, the community club here had a lot to do with the improvements on this building. Okay. I think this is, that's the end of this section. That's the end of the history lesson. 
Now we're going to take a short break and I'm going to go through the 1960s in Mountain Ranch and how it transpired and how it changed. There's some real kicks in there. You'll enjoy it, I hope. I'm ready. Uh, just another comment here on the history portion. The post office at Josie's Ranch and Mountain Ranch was the fourth one in this district. Uh, McCallamy Hill had a post office in 51. Mill Valley. Where's Mill Valley? No, no, no. If you go out Whiskey Slide Road and cross Sus Maria Creek, there was a town there. The Sharp family owns it now. That was called Mill Valley and they had a post office. We have a stamp or a mark on display at the post office across the street. Yeah, one of these days I'm going out there with my metal detector and really strike it rich. <laughs> West Point had a post office in 56 and Railroad had one in 57. We didn't get ours until 58. Anyway, that's enough of this old stuff. Some of you might remember the 60s, but like the man said, if you remember it, you weren't there. Oh, that's hard to believe. Look at the difference. 179 to 326, the population of the USA. You remember that Hawaii became a state in 1960? If you have a 48 star flag, you've got something pretty good. In 1960, old Kennedy was elected president over Richard Nixon in that famous television interview who, if you're old enough, you remember that. <laughs> if anything goes wrong with this projection, it's her fault. She's in charge of all that stuff. Remember the Bay of Pigs, the Cuban invasion? The Berlin Wall began in 1961. In 1962, John Glenn flew around the world, around the earth. In 63, Alcatraz prison was closed. While we're on that subject, if you look in that room next door of all my photos, my buckskin group that I used to have, uh, we traveled to powwows and rendezvous, and we got acquainted with a lot of the Indian leaders. So when they took over Alcatraz, they didn't want it. It was just a protest. I asked him what they needed, because. There was no power on Alcatraz. And he told me they needed candles and coats for kids and blankets and maybe a sack of beans. So we put a donation jar in every bar in Calaveras County and collected a ton of money. So we loaded a pickup, a great big high with all this kind of stuff. And we went to Fisherman's Wharf finding a way to get to Alcatraz. Those Italian fishermen wanted nothing to do with those Indians. But we run on to a half-breed Cherokee with a fishing boat and out we went. There's some really good photos on that table in there of us taking supplies to Alcatraz. Good, good program we had. And uh, 63 was Martin's speech and it's also in November of 63 is when John F. Kennedy was killed. Oh, well, in the next year, the Beatles came. <laughs> oh, old cautious Clay, Muhammad Ali, wins the boxing champion. And 67 was the first Super Bowl. You girls ought to remember that. <laughs> I couldn't believe it was that. <laughs> just, just, just yesterday was the first Super Bowl, huh? And also in 68, Martin Luther King was assassinated. And in 68, John F. Kennedy was assassinated. You know, that was a tough 10 years. 1960 to 1970, there was a lot screwing up. Neil Armstrong set foot on the moon in 69. And in 69, the uh, Indians occupied Alcatraz. And that's when we went over there. The Sanders family. There's 
Gus and wife, and there's Marge Mobley and Eric Sender. And he, he moved up here in ni this 1948 or 49, and in 1950, he opened the store where the old building was that we had pictures of. There they are again. Eric was good looking then. <laughs> oh. My my pointer's running out. There we go. That was uh, a school in uh, uh, Marge Mobley donated that picture for us to use. Uh, somewhere in there is Marge Mobley, and I'm not sure. That might be her right there. Huh? Number one. On the bottom it says number one with an arrow. Gird there? Nope. Yeah. Anyway, that was Mountain Ranch School in those days, and we don't have half that many kids now. There's another one. I think that's Marge right there. And there's the Mobley family. There's Ron and Chris and Troy. I think Chris now lives in Texas. There's Marge. Now that's what Sender's Market looked like when I came here. There's my junk room over there. 1962 Ford. Now Opa's Smokehouse is on the other side of it, see? You don't see that. There's an advertisement for the smokehouse. He had beer and sandwiches on it. And he made German sausages that were, you know, chunks of them were free at the bar, but you had to drink a lot of beer to, to stay with it. <laughs> Hope of Smokehouse. There's Gus Sender, Eric's father, in the store. There's some pictures of the store later on. You can really tell the difference between the early store. <laughs> yeah. He had everything. That was in 1952 or something, I think it was. There's when Eric and Polly got married. I'll tell you a story about that. In June of 1965, we had made the contract for the, my purchase here. That my, you know, and in, uh, in June, Mrs. Domeghini gave me the big deuce and a half truck that they owned to go down to Concord and pick up my junk and bring it up here. Well, Sunday morning we come in down Washington Street and there wasn't a soul in sight. There was carp, beer cups and crepe paper and paper plates scattered over this whole town. I thought, oh God, what did I do? <laughs> but that's the night before is when Eric and Polly got married in this building. And it was a mess. And the only guy we did see a little bit later was Polly's father, Paul Morse, Lived in Sheep Ranch. He was out picking up garbage. <laughs> that's uh, that's uh, Eric's father there. There's Cinder's Market. They specialized in meat. Eric uh, Gus Cinder was a butcher by trade from Prussia when he came to the United States. So he was a really good custom butcher. In 1968. Opa's smokehouse, which is right there, caused a fire and went in. I took these pictures from the front of which is now called Stark Realty, it's where I was living at the time. It, after the fire, the building was so cooked that uh, they couldn't salvage it. So Eric's father, I mean, uh, Polly's father, run a cable all the way around it, put it in the basement. So when you stand at the front door of Senders now, there's a city underneath you, right down there. All that junk, and uh, Mr. Senders, Gus, 
he had a lot of classic antiques from Prussia. Big jars this tall and, and rugs from all parts of Europe. And oh, he had a lot of nice stuff. It's all in the ground now underneath there. Now that's when they built the new store and opened up. That's, that's a postmaster, Virginia Butterfield. And that's Eric. That looks like Natalie, Eric's daughter. That's Mr. Richmond, who was one of the original investors in opening the market. No, oh, there's another shot of Gus. I don't know what that's doing there. Oh, it's just so you can see the difference between this. Oh, and right. <laughs> there's Polly Sender. That's a Sunday school, right? Uh, across the street from uh, Fender's now today in what we call the Tisher Building. The pickets have long gone, so they built a rail fence. <laughs> These pews were given to the Mountain Ranch Sunday School by a church in San Andreas that was modernizing or upgrading their thing, so they gave us their pews, and that's our Sunday school class. I don't know who there. There's another shop outside the building of the uh, Sunday school class. I don't know her. And that's a church service that was held there, uh, which included most of the adults. They never had a church in town until they built the one out there at uh, the Mountain Ranch Community Church. The Silver Spur! If you don't know where it is, now it's gone. It burnt up in the fire. But when I came here, that was a real honky-tonk bar. They told me when I moved here that if you go to the don't worry about what you take to the spur. So when you go in the door, they'll give you a knife or a gun. <laughs> I don't think it was that bad, but it was quite a place. Before the spur was built, across the street was the original bar by the Lidecker family uh, called the Tip Top. Right there, it's the spur right across the street on the left. Now there's a marijuana operation there. but. But that was the tip top, the forerunner to the Silver Spur. And they got to sold a couple of times and misbehaved and they uh, lost their whatever and they had to call it the, what they call it, the Golden Spur? Yeah, you know, the Golden Spur. They had to change the name. Uh oh. I wanted to warn you. Yeah. <laughs> When I first came here and started doing different projects and working, I hornswoggled all my brothers to come help me. And that's me and my four brothers. That's the oldest. The good looking one is me. That's Doug, who became a Southern Baptist minister in Baltimore, Maryland. That's Kenny. He was a bum all his life. And he lived in Kona, Hawaii. Lived on the beach for a long time. That's my youngest brother, and he was a, uh, he run a plumbing company in Grants Pass, Oregon. That's when Florence and I first got here. God, wasn't he good looking? Look at that. How old were you, Bill? How old was I? One hell of a lot younger than I am now. I came here in 1965, so I was about 32 years old. That's old lady Domagini and her daughter-in-law when we first bought the store. She was a great lady. I didn't think much of her, but <laughs> the old lady was, was a real charmer. She was great. She helped me a lot when I first started. That's what the store looked like. 
That's the bench where the old timers would sit. And that's what the inside of the store looked like. That fellow there is Francis DeVoto, Jerry Howard's step-grandfather. We had a little meat case here, newspapers. Huh? Yeah. We had a wood-burning stove. Look at, there's a cereal line. Look at the guns. In one corner of the store up high was a whole list of old patent medicines. And I kept most of those and I that their name now are on display at the Red Barn Museum. But if you read the label on some of those, there's some things in there that are illegal nowadays. <laughs> oh, that's quite a time. Quite a time. That's Francis DeVoto there, the guy that worked for the Domaguini family for many, many, many years. This paper wrapper is down at the uh, museum. I don't know what it is, but that stuff there must have been a good seller because they got a lot of it. What's the date up there in the corner? What is it? What's the date? 24? Oh. It's it's yeah. See there? It have a, I that was exactly 50 years ago today. <laughs> That's true, huh? <laughs> when I first came to Mountain Ranch, there was no street names. I couldn't find any there. And that Francis DeVoto that was at the grocery store there, he had an old map that he let me make a copy of. And so that's how I got the name of the, the streets. And uh, that's one of the this guy's pet cat up there on top of the sign. But that's how I got the Washington and Blacksmith and Garibaldi is from that old map. That right there is Stephen and that's Stuart. I had that little country store and I you know, tried to make a living out of it. And working 20 years for J.C. Penney he taught me that you got to have traffic. So that's what I started to do. Uh, in those days, every little town had their own fire department. And this was Sheep Ranch. And their annual fundraiser was a spaghetti feed. You didn't go there to eat good spaghetti. You went there to dance and see everybody you didn't see very often and listen to some good music. And Bonnie Sue and the Outlaw uh, she, they lived here, right across from Scotts Junction. And uh, they ended up playing music in uh, Tahoe and Carson City. She was a country western singer. Did very well. Anyway, we used to go to that feed and have a good time. There we are. There we are at the spaghetti feed. It, it wasn't really good spaghetti, but we had a good time, so to put on the dog, you know, I, I got to do something a little different. I, I brought a candle and they, uh, my own wine and the picnic basket, and that's when my wife was a redhead. Some of you guys might remember that. You do, don't you? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, she was a redhead. still have that shirt? Yeah. That was, a, that was a shirt, wasn't it, huh? That was a good one. In our buckskin gang, we used to go to the Murphy's big homecoming parade. And that is Florence with a black wig and this outfit she made in front of the Murphy's Hotel. And I was always trying to create Something, you know. Linda can tell you that. So, up on top of that hill back here, that I this right across the street, when, when the Calaveras Enterprise rent a story 
about uh, Black Bart getting out of prison and coming to Calaveras County, which is not true, but it was a good story. Because after Black, the truth is that Black Bart went to San Quentin, and when he got out, he disappeared. Nobody ever knew for sure where he was. So on top of that hill back there, I found his grave. Tombstone and the whole bit. So, I, there's a tombstone right there. See it? <laughs> that rock there came out of Cave City. The stalagmites inside the cave. Anyway, the newspaper guy got in tool. Channel 5 out of San Francisco heard about it. They came up. And man, I hornswoggled all of them. The only problem I had was we were standing there with the TV guy and the newspaper guy, and Stephen at that time was about 10 years old, and he saw that grave with the BB written on it, that tombstone. He said, it's probably some guy's dog named Bozo. <laughs> See right there? <laughs> anyway, we had a good time with that. There's a thing in, in West Point. Yeah, I put together a Pony Express when Lumberjack Days was first put on. It was called uh, Centennial Plus, uh, and, and the guys in West Point did a good job on that, and it eventually became the Lumberjack Days. So I tried to get done it, but you'll notice that there's Howard Copley and th that chief, and so, so we rode, uh, here we go, shootouts and Pony Express ride to, my, to uh, West Point, and we actually got permission to carry the mail. So we had five horses, went out Whiskey Slide, down to the Ponderosa, down to the Calaveras River, up to 26, over Alabama Hill, down to back of West Point. There we are, part of it. Anyway, we had a good time with that. So the Indians in West Point thought it'd be a good deal, so they ambushed us. <laughs> there, I had a really good pony, never wore a bit, had a bustle. And I, I, of course, being I put it on, I was the last rider coming into West Point. See, they, woo, look at that. We delivered the mail. There, and later, I was always trying to, because see, I had a beer bar. I had beer license. I could sell beer in that store on sale. You could drink it right there, see? So that was my livelihood. So I put together 14 wagons. And Juanita Newell, some of you may not remember her. She lived out on Warden Road. Her mother was a warden. Uh, and his number one drummer named... Gary Carr, lived out on Swiss Ranch Road, said, Phil, have you got a half a sheet of plywood? I said, well, yeah, why? He said, I want to put it in front of my bass drum, otherwise someone will throw a beer bottle through it. <laughs> anyway, we had some good dances, didn't we, Denny? Yep. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> There's part of the clampers that uh, showed up for one of the functions that we had here. Bunch of drunk idiots, but they did good work with the, the monuments. You're getting close to home. Yeah. <laughs> I was initiated in that group in 1966. I got a plaque hanging on my wall in the office. Yeah, in, in Murphy's, the Matuka chapter. Are you in that picture? Actually, I in the Paradise chapter. Yeah. Yeah, he's, he's there. I, I remember. In 1967, I wanted to add some muscle to my celebration I had, so I talked Mr. Universe to come to Mountain Ranch. <laughs> so he was here for all day long. Mr. Sipes, S-I-P-E-S, Mr. Universe. That's before Arnold Schwarzen whatever. <laughs> Guess who that is? Uh, this guy right here, he runs the garbage business in Columbia. Anyway, go ahead. In, in, 
a number of years later, we got a call, the, the uh, uh, I don't know what they call it, the, the, the uh, Amador Mountain Civil War Scrimmage Association, Company C, First Infantry, they, they invaded Calaveras County to take it over, which was a big to do. But anyway, <laughs> they come into Moak Hill and they captured the supervisor at that time and they come into San Andreas and they went down to Valley Springs. So I got a call from Don Cuno, who's, you know, the kind of the mayor of San Andreas. So uh, Mike McCombs and I got together and in the lot across the street before the post office was built, we were cooking a pig in the ground just to have a party. And there was a list of the guys that were there. And when they showed up, we had the fire truck primed and we hosed them down. <laughs> so we won that battle. There's part of the Civil War scrimmage group uh, that I had out in my pasture. That right down there is where the swimming pool is, the Lidecker property. You can see back here, the, that was where the rifle range for the Black Powder Boys. That's what we used for a rifle range. And then they started building houses on the other side of the hill, so we had to quit that. There's some of my Civil War boys that showed up, and they all have the black powder guns. So the Civil War boys challenged the Buckskin Mountain Men at a good contest. <laughs> when we first did that, we had real turkeys behind a log. And the guy would, blah, 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 the turkey would stick his head up, and then you're supposed to shoot it. You're supposed to shoot that turkey. Well, the Humane Society put a stop to that in a hurry. <laughs> Or the, and there's the guy that won the top one, Dave. Uh, <laughs> that was one of our posters that we put. You'll see some of them on the wall over here. Over there, see? The, the, the way we did our posters to advertise to get people here, see? So we had everything. Whatever I could think of, I stuck it on the, the thing. The small print had everything. The old prospector, Ben Fuller, he always put on a great show for everybody. We had a, a petting zoo. We called it farm animals. Buggy rides. Gary Josie drove Howard Copley's buggy, which is still up on top of that hill back there on Avenue A. It's what they call a leather trace wagon. Between the two axles, was leather back and forth a dozen times, like a spring, about six inches. And the bed of the wagon rode on that. That's why that thing rocks when you go. Anyway, I designed that bottom part. There's Dan Elzick and the Renegades. <laughs> There's Dan still kicking back there. Oh. That's one of the barrel racing contests we had out in my pasture. We had some good horses out there. That's a big old buckskin that the fellow that had the plumbing company in San Andreas. Oh, I can't think of his name. I'm getting so feeble-minded, but that's, that's the uh, stagecoach barn that is now gone. The cemetery is right up in there. Now that looks like Dan Elzick right there. That's one of the street dances. And we had people from Sender's Market down past my house. That gal right there, she danced with everybody. There's part of them up there, the cowboys. The only trouble I had with that dance, uh, I thought I was real smart. I had the muzzle-loading guys shooting rifles on the rifle range. Then I had the cowboys doing the gym cannon, the barrel racing. But at that dance, one of those cowboys says, you're the SOB that fired that gun the minute my horse was going around that barrel. Pooh! <laughs> that right there is my sister-in-law from my brother in Grant's Pass. Look at the kids. That's up up there on the, that's Danny's band up there on the, I had a museum in that building for a number of years. A nice project, but you don't make any money at all.
Come to see the elephant. You know what that is? No. Somebody knows what? If you were a mountain man or a 49er, a gold miner, and you came in here and you saw this and this and this, the way they lived their life and what they did, then you had seen the elephant. I didn't know when Mountain Ranch was dis discovered in the old days. I didn't know nothing about it. So I pulled out the top of my hat, 111 years. <laughs> Sounded good at the time. See, we had, we had a two-day celebration, the pancake breakfast, the barbecue, Saturday and Sunday, plus a horse show and a gym canna and a street dance on Saturday night, plus other fun-provoking items. There's the muzzle loaders over there. Now there's the horse arena that was out in my pasture. That's my house there. That's the barn. Uh, that's the house that burnt down. The cemetery is right up there. We used this truck and put planks across the railing to use it for an announcing stand. We run an electric cord from there over to the cabins where Ron Klempke lived. Some of you may remember him. And that's how we got power for our PA system. This is one of my parades. We had parades. That's one of the wagons that come from I don't know where. There's a fire truck that sits right across the street. That's when we first bought that for $200, Edith Domaghini gave us some money and uh, we bought that and built the firehouse, which is right next door to us here. And then they got into, what do they call it? Cal, Cal, Cal Fire? What do you call it, Chief? Central Calaveras. Central Calaveras Fire developed that. So the little towns then fire department incorporated into those. So that was a bygone era. And a fellow down in Ripon bought it for, put it, park it in front of his gas station. So I knew him, so when he got out of the gas station business, he asked me, so I bought it. So now it's sitting across the street. But uh, it was in pretty good shape then, it's getting kind of ratty now. But we always had a crowd, look at that, all the way down in front of Cinder's Market. Look at this. Where is the market? Cinder's? That's right there. It's hidden. I covered it up. That's a dance school in San Andreas. It's still, in, it's still there. See? They put on a good show for the spectators. But, but I drew spectators. Look at that. We had a... That's a friend of mine from the Farmington Feed Store in those days. And he always took all kinds of animals and made them do what they do naturally. He trained this one from just a calf, and he'd walk over to the crowd, the kids would pet it, had horns that big around, but it was the most gentle animal you ever saw for a Brahma bull. Look at, look at that. Just scared the hell out of you just looking at him, you know? But he, he was a good guy. He, he really did a nice job. One year he brought up a whole big horse trailer full of geese, and he opened the door and out they went. And I thought, oh, come on, Clyde, what are you doing? He whistled, had a little blue-eyed healer dog that made a big circle, and all those geese fell right behind him, and he snaked his way down the parade route with the single-file geese. He's a good man. Oh, look up there. Oh, where, where, uh, look, what's that say? Happy birthday. I didn't know what year it was, but it was a birthday. Oh, there's old, there's old Ben, the prospector I told you about. He had a six gun and he put on a nice show. I also had street fights, gun fights. And uh, there's a couple of them that didn't make it. The first one we put on, one of the guys got shot sitting on the porch of that old warehouse and he fell down and hit the porch and bounced off and went on the street. And some poor old lady from the spectators come running out to see, see, 
see if he was really shot. <laughs> Across the street. Oh. Oh, I'll go back. I thought we were done. No, go back. There you go. See that old gas pump? Uh, yeah. uh, where's it at? Right there. That's now in my front yard. This building with a Union Ice label right there, that was our ice house. We sold blocks of ice out of there. And that's the house that burned down. You see the gals in costume? Ah, good. That was a nice, a nice program we put on for the spectators. In, inside that building is where we had those silent movies. And the Indians from West Point came down and put on a really nice show of old authentic dances and whatnot. Also to create, you know, I'm trying to make a living, guys. Come on, I was trying to do something. <laughs> so we developed a 10-mile horse race from sheep ranch to mountain ranch, and the finish line was right in front of my beer booth. <laughs> we came... From the, from the ballpark or you know, old firehouse there in Sheep Ranch, we went up Frico City Road all the way down till we got opposite Cave City. Then we came down off of Cave City, across the creek, came up Cave City Road until we got to where now is called Adobe Gulch. We came down that across Norman Gunsel's property and come right down in front of my beer booth. And that gal right there won the race. She run the race. She had a little black mare. That's the little black mare with her. And when she come running into the finish line, her butt was about as white as a horse. You couldn't tell which is which. But anyway, <laughs> great girl. And this guy, Carl, he had a big old buckskin horse that she outran him coming down past the cabins down Garibaldi Street. Good horse race. We did that a couple of years in a row. There, we had a, when the, we had the party out in the field and blah, 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 we always had a big dance in here. Half of them, Dan Elzig played music for us. And this was the costume contest. We had a military, we had a buckskin couple, and an individual, and this is Stuart, Stuart Albert. That guy was really big. But we had a nice costume contest. Huh? Is he wearing your costume from before when you were with your wife? Yeah. Yep. Now there's a really mean mountain man. I have a 45 caliber Kentucky squirrel rifle, and that's what I'm using there. That's you? That's me. This is Marge right here, the tall the mother. Uh, who was, see the black powder stuff there? She was a crack shot with a pistol. And that's her daughter, 10 year old from Clovis. And she was pretty good. She held that rifle and this with a small muzzle loader, but she shot it. We had a contest. I'll talk about Marge for a minute if I got time. Am I running over the time? What's the time? I'm okay? All right. We had a contest between Sheriff Leech and the mountain men, we challenged them to a contest for pistols. The, the deputies could use their service pistol and we would use the black powder pistols. So we did that and then we exchanged pistols and let the deputy use the black powder and we used their service revolver. Of course, we beat the hell out of them every year. <laughs> Those guys are not good shots. You know, when you see on the news, they fired 147 shots at some car. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, it was a five-man contest. So prearranged joke or whatever you want to call it. I had four of my guys come out with their pistols. Oh, I'm short a man, Sheriff. What will I do? I said, wait a minute. There's a little old lady over there. Marge, come here. So she come out there, crack shot. <laughs> she just whipped, oh. Oh, Le Sheriff Leach got after me for a long time. <laughs> You'll recognize that location that's out in my pasture. The, uh, the house down there, that's the Lidecker property. But anyway, 
Marge was a good girl. And this woman could throw a tomahawk. She was really good at it. We'd put a playing card, ace of spades, on a big chunk of wood. She did well. Most of those guys were in the contest, but she, uh, she made them look bad. <laughs> Benny. Now in the 60s, you know, a lot of things happened in the 60s. We got invaded for a couple of years by, you know, I think Mrs. Swan might be in there somewhere. <laughs> uh, good time had by all. Uh, there, there's some more of them. There, see, there's Cinder's Market. When, you, when I see a tie-dye nowadays, I think of that. And there's still quite a few of them that wear tie-dyes around here, but uh, I always think of that bunch. We've had two different movies that we hornswoggled to come to Mountain Ranch. One of them was, uh, uh, that looks like uh, Richard Widmark's movie. I can't see the pictures, but... Uh, no, that was Clint Eastwood. In, that was in 1982 that Clint Eastwood was here. This was in 1969 when uh, Richard Widmark was here with his crew and uh, it was called... Uh, it is Moonshine, Moonshine War. War? Yeah, right, it was Moonshine War. Uh, the one that uh, Clint Eastwood did was called Honky Tonk Man. Yes. And that was filmed here too? Huh? That was filmed here too? Yeah, wow. yeah. Boy, they pay good, let me tell you. I, you know, they don't, when they brought that movie crew up, they rented this pasture out here because they, they don't plug into your electric service. They have a cord that's just big around and they run it from that pasture all the way uptown for their own electrical service. And the guy that's in charge of this, real nice fella, there's Moonshine War. Uh, he said, well, that pasture ought to be about $2,000 for a couple of days. I said, oh, yeah. <laughs> so he brings out a roll of bills like this and just peels them off. They used my gas pump. They used my telephone booth. They used that old warehouse. Oh, that was good. There's, it, you know, you think it would, you can see when you watch this why movies cost so much money. They had doings on the porch of a couple of drunks arguing or whatever they were doing. And they put those lights up there because it took them about five hours. And of course, the shade on the porch moved. So they put them lights up so the shade would not move. It looked like they did it in two minutes in the, in the finished product, but it took them four hours to film it. There's some more of them in front of the store. Richard Peabody, he played in a lot of little guy movies, whatnot. He was in that Moonshine War movie, and he'd come into my store and get a beer and sit down, drink it, and just start whatever, have conversation with people, really nice fella. And the director would holler, and out the door he'd go and run over on the porch to do whatever he was to do. And pretty soon something wasn't just right, cut! So they'd all disappear, and he come, but and they were drinking moonshine out of a fruit jar, moonshine war, but it was really water, you know. By the time he got through, Peabody was shot. Let me tell you. Oh, there's that's Florence and her little partner. They were extras in the movie. That's one of the actors in that movie. That was a good time, had by all. That's the very first poster I put together for a celebration, I think that was 66. We had a hot air balloon. I organized and come here, a guy with a hot air balloon out of Sacramento. He was in that pasture across the street there. So they got ready to do it. They fired up the thing and the, the, that balloon came about a third up and caught on fire. <laughs> I got more excitement and more publicity and more things in it. It's a damn thing that went on 100 feet in the air. 
It never did get off the ground. Uh, I had, uh, oh, nope. I had the uh, horseless carriage come from uh, Modesto. Came up with about 25 cars. It was really a nice show. There, see, there's a hot air balloon ascension. <laughs> Pancake breakfast was held here in the hall. Uh, I don't know whether we can see one of these. It, it was in April. We had, it was kind of cold, so we cooked stew to feed and sell and make some money of all the buckskins and the cowboys and whatnot here in the hall. So I had the community club. There was about eight or ten of the women. I said, make me a pot of stew about this big, about that deep. But I want some game in it, a venison or elk or, you know, something, bear. I don't care what it is. So we brought it in here, and we had a pot about that big and about that big around, and we poured all of those buckets into that, and we had bear cat stew. You'll see it on those posters. I had a hide that my friend of mine, Walt Jones, brought down from Armstrong Road of a bear cat, a uh, bobcat, about that wide and about this long. So I nailed it on the kitchen wall in there. I had two ladies that wouldn't eat it. They thought, they thought there was really cat in that bear cat stew. Anyway, that's the very first one, 66 or 67, somewhere in there. Brown, see Brown's Reservoir? Now called M24. We had a, we had a really, really bad winter. Uh, uh, just rained like crazy, and that dam broke. See, there's a cut in the dam. See? This is a cliff over on the north side of the lake, 1966. The water went down uh, the, the, the dam down across the Sheep Ranch Road just after you make the fork from Scotts Junction. And on the right-hand side, there's a house made out of stone, river rock. We've got a lady back here that lives in that house now. Uh, it flooded all of that in front and went down to the next house where there's two ponds and a driveway in the middle of them. It flooded all that. That's called McKinney Creek. And it went down and runs into O'Neill and on down toward Calvaritas. But that was a big deal. There, there's the cut, see? When they went to fix that dam, they brought up one of those giant backhoes that, you know, bigger than any normal backhoe we, we see. And he's scooping it out to fix that dam. And <laughs> here come up a, a, a catfish about that big, right in his bucket. He threw it over on the ground and the kids went and got it. <laughs> those kids right there. Yeah, that was not good. Have you ever been down to Cave City in the wintertime? That's a dam down there at Cave City during a hard winter. That dam was built for what they call a Debus Dam. It, it backed up the silt and the garbage that came from mining. It was not made to create a lake or a pond. So behind that dam it's just solid, solid dirt. So when it rains really hard, that's what happens. Looks like Niagara Falls. That was in 05, see? See all these nice things around Mountain Ranch that you're missing? I mean, I know you lead a real sheltered life, but you gotta get out a little bit. That's that real nice building where uh, the Sunday school was. What's that say in front of it there? The sheriff? Yeah. The sheriff, the sheriff rented it for a place for the volunteers, sheriff volunteers and the deputies to stop and do their paperwork and phone calls and blah, blah. So they fixed it up. And that, was, that was recent. To, O2. It looked really nice. Since then it's gone to hell, but it was good then. Is it used for anything? Huh? Is it used at all? No. Not now. It's vacant. It's, it, there's no water or sewer. 
if you look real close between that house and the street, you'll see the outhouse. And got, got a nice two over back there. That's your last slide. Huh? That's, your last That's it? That's it. My goodness sake. Thank you very much, guys.